Hello, welcome to Supper Time. We're on episode four now, which is, I mean, that happened quick, right? Because I just launched two days ago. <laughs> so I'm here with uh, Dr. Alan Rao, who many of you who are just like in my audience and following me on things know, because he gave a TED Talk in May of 2019. And as I explained on stage, that was by virtue of my suggesting that he apply and then our whole volunteer team just loving him. And so, Alan, you got to give an amazing talk on uh, sort of passing a baton in in May. And I have since then said many times that you're like a walking TED Talk. And I'm so glad you got to stand up and give a TEDx talk. It was so much fun. But what I think is fascinating and many people don't realize is that we've known each other literally since I was born, I think. And so I want to talk a little bit about that. How do you, how, what do you, when people ask us how we know each other, what do you say? Well, Steve, I, I refer to the fact that your mom and I were in a PhD program together at uh, Utah State. I mean, that's one of the things that comes to mind first and foremost. And, right. and, and, and she was gestating you there <laughs> in, inside the hangar. And then you arrived up in, in Logan, Utah. And yeah. so I, I, the thing I remember most significantly about spending time with you very, very early in, in your life, and you, much, you were only a few months old at the time, was that it was, so you were born in June. And so I think you would have been six months old, months old because your mom and I decided to carpool together in, <laughs> in your, your marvelous VW. Oh, in yeah. In the Cabriolet. In the Cabriolet. In the Cabriolet. Um, and so you were in your car seat in the back, and we trekked on down from Logan, Utah, to Colorado Springs because our our you know, respective families were both in that area. And so we had a lot of time on the road uh, listening to you. Uh, what you know? What what is that? A babble, you know, or talk? Of course, okay. yeah. In those early days, Steve was almost talking, I guess. But anyhow, wow. uh, that's my first extended ex experience uh, with you. And then fast forward a little bit to maybe it would have been six years forward, I think, when you began learning to ride a bicycle. And at that time, I'm not sure why I was in Colorado Springs again, but I was. And it was really, it was really huge for me, because to me, kids have uh, always been important, and the relationship to kids. And I don't know, I, somehow or another, I have present in my mind. I guess what it was like to be a kid, just intuitively, not necessarily specific, a whole lot of specific memories. Some, but not many. But it's just that kind of gut feeling, if you wish, that hey, you're, you're dealing with a really important being here. And, and I, I, I had that opportunity, and, and it was really a flashback to me from my time in, in teaching my two sons how to, and of course, since then, I've adopted you as my, I call you my young son now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I feel the same way. I feel like you're a, a bonus parent. So it's an, <laughs> uh, such, a, such a fun thing, the friendship that we have now. We reconnected, though, really in serious, I think, when you went to your 50th uh, anniversary of graduating the Air Force Academy, right? And that was a few years ago. Yeah, we did. And in fact, before we, you know, in getting ready for our this this conversation we're doing, I was thinking, was that it? And I think that was it. Um, yeah. You came I out and visited the folks house and we ended up sitting on the porch and having yep. tea and just rambling for hours about so many oh, things. And it was so it, cool to get to catch up with you after so many years of... It, of it was... Uh, yeah, it, it was fantastic. And so actually, it was, it was then, then, it, it, that because your your Monday conversations that you set up with me originated from then. That you know, was that. Yeah, we started yeah. weekly conversations that we've had every week now for, has it been two or three years? It's been two years, actually. Three. No, wait. Uh, no, 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 no. Excuse me. Five Somewhere years. In that, but, Somewhere no, no, in it was, that range. It, it, it was November of 2015. It's because, been five wait, wait, years wait, wait, two, of weekly well, calls. Hold, hold, hold a second. I, yes, five years because uh, it was for, if you may recall, it was for my 50th uh, reunion of my Air Force Academy graduating class. And that I was a class of 65. So that wow. was 2015. <laughs> okay, so for five years, we've had weekly calls, Alan and I. And yeah. throughout that period of time, nothing has been more clear to me than that Alan has so many cool ideas that are, are always just fascinating to talk about. You can hear he's a natural storyteller. And so I, <laughs> part of what I'm excited to do on, on this hour that we get to talk together and have sort of a video interview is give you an, an opportunity to tell some of those stories. And you really, really handed me like a perfect setup here with this list of three to five questions I should ask you is the prompt <laughs> on Calendly when people book 
And Alan did not give me three to five questions. He gave me like topics, like a list <laughs> of topics. It was so cool. So let me read some of those. Okay. Uh, first off, MIT Media Lab Aspen Project. Okay, so in one sentence, Alan, I know this is going to be very difficult for you, but in one sentence, what is the MIT Media Lab Project? Okay, Aspen. the MIT Media Lab Project, Aspen Project in particular, was an interactive video project in well initiated by a guy named Nicholas Negroponte. So that's one sentence. Uh. That's one okay, yeah. Okay. So I, I have read part of his book called The Media Lab, and that's yeah. what you're referring to here. A- actually, that I'm has glad to you... do with Aspen, Colorado? Yes, I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned the book The Media Lab because actually it was not Nicholas Negroponte, it was Stephen, it was Stuart Brandt that wrote the book, oh, The Media okay. Lab. And that's your next line item. So here, hold on one second. Yeah. I'll be right okay. back. Okay, and I will so, have a sip of water. You gave me just a bit ago this, the last yeah. whole catalog, yes. the actual one, like the physical. The, My the physical. Uh, yeah, exactly. Wow. Exactly. <laughs> wow. So that exists. And Stuart yeah. Brand, of course, is the person who wrote that. And this is the thing for those of you that don't know what's up here. This is the thing that Steve Jobs referenced in his like super, super famous graduation speech that Ted like co-opted as a Ted talk. I don't know if you knew this, Alan, but they posted that graduation commencement on their site as a Ted talk now because wow. Steve passed away before he ever gave a Ted talk. And so <laughs> in wow. that, in that talk, he mentions that the last whole earth catalog actually ends with like a final paragraph that inspired a lot of his career. And that's this book right here. So pretty cool. Stuart Brand ended up publishing and collaborating with Kevin Kelly, who founded Wired Magazine. And they're sort of like the thought leaders of Silicon Valley yeah, startup and a, culture and, in and, many and, ways. And, oh, yeah. And, 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 and also in the amazing continuation of our societal intellectual heritage with their the, the Long Now Society, right? Yeah, which is now just one of my favorite coffee shops in San Francisco. The Long Now <laughs> Foundation has a bar. So they, they, they have such a funny story there. So Stuart Brand and, and Kevin Keller are now like 70 and 80. And they're mm-hmm. thinking about what, what should our legacy be, right? And they, they did a little research and they said, well, the longest lasting institutions on earth are churches, universities, and bars. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to start a university and we're definitely not going to start a church. So we've got to start a bar. <laughs> and so that's what they oh, did. They started did, this and it, it's beautiful. Yeah, they have a bunch of like old bourbon whiskey <laughs> that's aged hanging from the ceiling. But they founded it by having people buy like thousand dollar bottles of, of whiskey that they would let age for years and years and years. They've mounted wow. those in the roof. So now oh, wow. you can come and have your own specific whiskey that's a part of the roof if you were one of the founding members wow or or it's a coffee shop during the day it's like the coolest organization in the world it's called the long now and it's on the pier right next to the right next to the marina in san francisco with a beautiful view overlooking it. well i i I hereby uh claim that you and i are going to get to go either have both a coffee in the morning or a matcha tea if you wish spend the whole day there yes they're amazing people (laughs) Yes, exactly. Yeah. And they and Stuart Brand still to this day has talks live posted on, on online from that venue, that space where he has conversations like this with people all the time. Oh, I didn't know that. I have to tune in Pretty to good. that. Hold on, I'll make sure to include that in the show okay, notes. Uh, okay, okay good. next is Air Force Academy. You want to talk about some of your time there or Air Force Academy in general? What were you thinking? Well, before we do that, may, may, may I say something about the Aspen Project? No, before... we're just going line by line. We'll come back to it. We're just going oh, line by line through all of them. Oh, so okay, Air Force so Academy. So yeah, one and, sentence and then, and then about we'll come what back. you wanted. To, we'll come back. Don't worry. Oh, okay, great, uh, okay. You wanted to talk about the Air Force Academy for for what? What's your one sentence summary of what you had in mind there? I was probably the only guy, only cadet in my class, who at graduation threw his hat on the ground. Oh, okay. That's a wow. That's a captivating one sentence. Now I can't not come back to that. Okay, uh, Defense Language Institute. Okay, Defense Language Institute. That was where I got to set up the first technology, the learning learning technology, or you know, in, pardon me, instructional technology division. I was the founder of the instructional technology division at Defense Language Institute. And we can come back yes. to that. A lot of, a lot of stuff that. spins off from that. Pre-development survival Arabic project. Okay, that actually... A hell of a list, dude. Yeah, yeah. That... Um, 
is that, you know, I guess in, in one sentence, is that I was privileged to be the co-director and the instructional designer of a project funded by U.S. Third Army, and which involved National Security Agency, Defense Language Institute, the Monterey Institute of International Studies, among others, and as the name indicates, pre-deployment survival Arabic to teach as much Arabic as possible to service people who are going to be deployed to the Middle East in 10 days. And 10 in days. 10, you had 10, 10 days to teach them Arabic. Yes. And in 10 days... Okay, we we'll took, come back to that. Okay, great. That's okay, fine. Semantic granularity. Okay. Uh, this. And this is my favorite topic. I think we might have to start there. Okay, great. Because you, you and I had talked about uh, interrupt granularity a lot. Uh, yeah. In those days, our conversations, weekly conversations after 2015, and what is mm -hmm. uh, semantic granularity? Okay, I'll let you leave me in mystery there. Let's okay. let's talk about the next line item because we're going to come back to semantic granularity. We'll start there. Okay. Stephen Krashen and comprehensible input in one sentence. In one sentence, quote, quoting Stephen Krashen, um, let's see, massive amounts of comprehensible input result in language acquisition, not just language learning. Wow. Okay. And that's that's not a yeah, not an exact quote because he might have written it a little bit differently in his book, but that is the context of uh, for me the work of Stephen Krashen. So there, there are overlaps with artificial intelligence and data capture and all this. Oh, oh true. I mean, reference. even though he, he, he published that book, I think it was 19, in his book, he wrote that in a book published, I think it was 1982. Whoa. Okay, wow. So it had nothing to do with any of that. Then. No, but, but it has, um, but actually at the time we were doing it, it had tremendous, yeah, tremendous impact, tremendous implications for what we're doing today. Cool. Chunking from the Gulf to the ocean. Okay, well... That related to the actually brings together Defense Language Institute a whole lot of things. How does one how does one make input comprehensible? And then I came up with a, a way of doing that because there was a still video, still frame video uh, course in Arabic that came out of St. Joseph's collaboration between the Center in Paris, Language Center in Paris, and St. Joseph's Un University in Beirut. And it was the most f most forward forward looking course in Arabic that pro that has probably ever ever been created. And if what you was forward looking about it in, uh, in one sentence, still, it allowed students to learn spoken Arabic without having to go through learning Arabic script first. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, next, turn taking in human relations. Okay. Well, interrupt granularity as I was thinking about our conversation. Communication depends largely upon our ability to take turns in our communication with somebody. Otherwise, we're preaching or teaching or diatribing or something like that. We're not communicating. Wow. That is a really powerful and interesting thing to hear you say given your context. I mean, I don't know how many people watching this know that you were a professor for your whole life. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So to hear you say <laughs> preaching or teaching is not communication. Now I've got to ask you to break that down a little bit for me. That, that needs more than one sentence. Okay, more than one sentence. Then it's very interesting. I, I happen to participate still in listening to preachers. <laughs> and yeah. the preacher I, I currently listen to says, we, some doubt we, I'm trying to remember the exact quotation, but like, we, we hear in rows and we learn in circles. And at his church, he has really stressed small groups because he recognizes that if we come in once a week and listen to him preach, now, how much have we really assimilated? <laughs> you know? We hear in rows and we learn in circles. Yeah, th that's roughly so, the quotation. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's very interesting. And is that maybe a function of people teaching us in rows, but mm -hmm. we learn in circles? Yeah, yeah. Like when I was a student at the Sorbonne, I mean, you would go into these huge amphitheaters, classrooms, and there would be hundreds of students in there and one professor up, t up front yeah. teaching. 
And, and oh, you, in rows, literally, like rows in classrooms. Yeah, in rows wow. in classrooms, like and and in like in rows of pews in, in a church or rows of seats in a church. And, okay, so he didn't mean information, like or like the path through the information. He meant literally the way that people are sitting in the venue. Yeah, yeah, literally the way, literally the way people are sitting in in a university or in a cathedral. We learn in circles. And but but the circles. Do you think that's like, true? It always has been. I mean, you know, they circled around the campfire. They sat there. The bards would come. The minstrels would come. The, you know, the shamans or whoever was presiding, um, and, and they would they were you know circled around the campfire, just you know close enough to hear the the person who was was speaking to hear one another. I love that so much. I have thought a lot lately about this because I now teach my own online course, but then also have been thinking about sort of the overlap between fundamentals and like really understanding the basic core concepts that cause a thing to happen. But then also the way most people learn by analogy, the the like, okay, so for example, for the people who are epidemiologists, I know we, I said we wouldn't talk about COVID, but this is the example that comes to mind <laughs> for the people, for the people that I'm, like I'm, understand. I'm, I'm not going to call foul. I'll let you do it. I'll let you, one, at least it. one. Okay. <laughs> you, at least one sentence. Yeah. The people who understand epidemiology got to look at the numbers and then they immediately understood the outcome because they understand the fundamentals. And so they freaked out. But the average person doesn't understand the fundamentals of how disease diseases spread. And so they see a number like 500 people have it and they don't panic. Right. And they, they're not looking for a transmission rate or anything like this. And so th those are the people that have to learn in a circle, right? We have to have social support to understand the context of the world we're in a lot of the time, because we don't have time to become experts in everything. That's right. And so circles help us learn when we're not an expert at something. And lines help us learn to become an expert in something. I think that's generally true. I, what, what comes to mind is you know, the Platonic model of that in the peripatetic school because they would walk around. They would walk around. They weren't sitting down. And uh, the teacher was, you know, was talking with the students. So it was a small enough group of students, people, that they could walk around in a small group and talk. And the whole key to it was that the teacher would not teach. The teacher would ask questions. Wow. And so that's where I think that's how tying things together. That's one way that interrupt granularity and, you know, semantic granularity fit together with crashes, you know, thing about comprehensible input is that if you don't really understand it, you don't understand it, you know, but how do we, how do we understand well, we ask. We get to ask a question as a learner. Hey, I don't understand this. Can you repeat that? I didn't, or maybe I didn't hear it clearly. What does this word mean? What does that word mean? And that it's that interaction that that results. So, if in our current situation, if the the experts had been able to gather together with somehow or another people who were able to say, wait a minute, I don't understand this. Can you explain this to me without being embarrassed? Understanding that it's okay not to know, it's okay not to understand. You know, wow. that, that you're not, you're not considered dumb or stupid or irrelevant because you're asking a question, you know, it, you're, wow. you're, you're, you're considered to be a good student because you're asking a question and you're not just considered to be a good student. You are not, you are becoming a good learner. Right. But, it's participation in that circle. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're, I still got to get through the rest of the line items, but that's okay. fascinating. That's so okay. cool. Okay. Uh, and then Pascal and the two infinitives was your next point. That sounds somewhat related to this. Okay. Well, <laughs> Pascal on two infinities are that we will never arrive at the end of learning. And, and his thing is he looked, even then when he wrote back in those days before all the science we have, he understood that the universe was infinite. Somehow or another, he intuited that, that there were planets beyond our planet and that there were solar systems beyond our solar systems and that there were galaxies beyond our galaxies so yeah you know, he, he realized that if you go you know in to the toward the infinite large it just goes on and on and on and on and we'll, we'll never we'll never get to the end of that okay and and then infinitely small the same way as if you keep breaking things down ah uh, the two infinities okay so that things go infinitely bigger than us and infinitely smaller than us and we happen to be just in between yes yeah, i've heard so that concept too and i think it's super fascinating that 
if you really do look at the scale of things in the universe, as best we can tell, this may just be a function of the size that we are. We can only see things that are so much smaller, so much bigger than us. But if from as far as we can tell, everything in the universe is either, you know, 10 orders of magnitude smaller than us or 10 orders of magnitude bigger than us. And it's strange when you think about it, it's kind of counterintuitive that we're right in the middle there. Like, yeah. Is there any good reason that we're not more toward the biggest side of big things in the universe or more toward the smaller side of smallest things in the universe? No, we're just right in the middle. We are the middle size objects in the universe, us yeah. people. It's and, so strange. And, and we always will be in the middle because we are who we are and we are. And I mean, if infinite is infinite, I mean, and so. Ah, it's, yeah. You see? And so that's what I'm saying, right? Maybe it's a function of our size instead of a function of the natural state of the universe. It's a function of uh, also a function of infinities. <laughs> yeah, that, that as well. The unfortunate fact of infinities is that they're finding, find, terribly finding, difficult to make any decisions or measure. Yeah. And, and finding, finding, the mid, find the, finding the midpoint of two infinities is <laughs> a damn tricky task. A damn tricky okay. task. Um, disciplined <laughs> alternation of activities. And this is where I will also give you one free pass on COVID-19, especially in the context of COVID-19 working from home. So talk to me about disciplined, disciplined alternation of activities, because I know a lot of people are right in the middle of figuring out how to work that into their lives right now. How are well, you doing? Well, well, I, I, I'm lacking a little bit in self-discipline, but I, I aspire to spend no more than 15 minutes in front of my computer or any given activity where I'm sitting down. And then because, you know, we're, we're now, I can't go to the gym, you know, I can't go out and. It is now possible to be sedentary 100% of the time. (laughs) Yes, one could, one could. And at the end of the day, when I do that, I just feel totally bummed, you know? And so. I, I I often set my I've got my phone here and I'll set the the time we can see my phone there and so we I'll set the, the you know the the clock has the little timer function and I I actually have it normally set to fifteen minutes so and that's my that is my interrupt granularity right there in in wow. my life and if I if I set that and then it, if I'm disciplined enough after fifteen minutes I'll say okay I'll whoop, get up from the computer. And do your exercise. Do I think that's good inspiration for all of us, no matter what context in life you're in. I think oh, no matter great. what. No matter so what. what I've always loved about our conversations is that you're extremely talented at developing these frameworks where, like interrupt gra- granularity, where like you will put a label on an idea and then you will like very concretely think through every aspect of that idea and how it relates to other things. It's an enormous talent. It, have you? So before we get into any one of those particular things, have you always been that way? Did you grow up doing that? When did that habit of yours start? Where you'll label something completely brand new, like like interrupt granularity, and you'll put a bunch of ideas together about it. I haven't met very many people that do that. I'm very interested in why you do it. Well, that's interesting. I'll have to um, default to what immediately comes to mind, which is not me, but which is my daughter, Sophie, because she's always asking me these questions like, Daddy, you know, why do we call cows cows? So just any word, yeah. take any word. Why do we yeah. use this word for that thing? And 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 who who first used that word? So lately, you're being asked these questions because you have young kids in the house. I well, think yeah. a lot of people are going to be familiar with that. Yeah, is that something that you also did with your young boys when you were raising them? Oh yeah, I mean, I okay. where you'd yeah. put models of the universe together in an attempt to answer their questions about. The oh world. yeah, I yeah, and, and I, 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 I I will tend to go on about it until they get bored. <laughs> and not, That's not a great a trick. trick. Put the kids to sleep by just talking. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. I mean, you, it's totally valid. Many parents have tried it. Um, yeah, no, before I, it's that, not, it's before not, you it's ever had goal. kids, it's, it's not my goal. It's still, you know, because <laughs> oh. I, I'm, I'm really, you know, I get into it with them. Like, read, don't you know, just, you know, because. I'm saying, wow, she's got a great question. I don't know. I don't know. I, and I then you find out and you just want to talk about it. I, I, well, I want to explore it. I want to talk. Yeah, I want to talk about it because I the use you know, the dialectic you know, to kind of dig into it and say, you know, examine my thoughts about it and, you know, try to come to some fundamental truth about it or understanding mm-hmm. yeah. about it. And yeah. you asked me about my thinking. And I think what what comes to mind right now, too, right now too is that I was – I was raised in a yeah. I was not raised in the postmodern period, and so okay. the I was exposed to to narratives, and I thought narratives were fairly valid. They are actually really valid. Oh, specific, interesting. Specific. And then what is the post? Oh, go ahead specifically. 
Well, okay. The the postmodern thing is that the that all nar- narratives are invented and in that they they just narratives are, are false. Yeah, yeah, they're false. They're and, a tool um, and not yeah. a, a map of reality. They're yeah, just or a, a distortion. Or a distortion, yeah. which is also right. true, but or in some cases true. But I okay. specifically, my mom exposed me to the uh, Aesop's fables. Some people pronounce Aesop is A E S O P, a Greek Aesop. Aesop's fables was the way we pronounced it at home. I've heard it. And uh, okay, well, the, the, and, and today I don't think kids get even exposed to that. Because, but the thing about Aesop's fables, they get fables, exposed to Jake Paul's fables. It's fine. It's just as valid, is it not? Oh, I don't know. I don't know anything about Jake Paul. <laughs> okay, that's good. You should keep it that way. Good. Okay, then I'm I'm blessed in that in that regard. But <laughs> but the the thing is that in Aesop's fables, there is always a moral, and I can remember as a little kid, you know, saying something like, "Now the moral to this story is telling adults." Well, the moral to this story is. And they would say, oh, you're so smart or something like that. You know, it would get their attention <laughs> that I was deriving some moral lesson from uh, or logical lesson from a particular story. And mm. so I, I guess that the, I just really loved the way Aesop would tell his you know, fables. And then later on came across, you know, Jesus teaching in parables. And to me, it's very much the same thing. How And, and you know, good teaching then ultimately is – is if you can couch something in storytelling, which of course today is a big thing, t- yeah. storytelling. Well, Aesop was all about storytelling. Jesus was all about storytelling. And we tell stories, and somehow or another, it allows people to make this input comprehensible. I mean, you're back you know, to Christ's thing, is that, that if, if somebody's just standing up talking to us, how do we relate all, to, all of that to our experience? But with a story, if it's told right, like Aesop always, you know, chose things that are just evergreen, like the fox and I think the fox and the and the crow and the cheese. That's interesting. Okay. So I've got to interrupt you there because you don't do this, and I'll I'll talk for a second a little bit about about stories too, since you bring it up. I think this is fascinating. I've been thought thinking a lot about this lately too. The idea of stories and like how it makes people change their actions. Yeah. So Elena and I were literally just talking on the last show about how the different seasons of our lives have taught us different stories that we've been able to put together in retrospect into a narrative form to learn something from them and behave differently. Um, And we sort of wrapped the episode last night talking about, well, okay, you know, how are we going to behave differently and, and more confidently take hold of what we want in our lives as a result of sort of the stories that we've put together in hindsight about what happened to us in our lives. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. I think people do that a lot and sometimes a that lot. can serve a purpose and sometimes it can just make you miserable. But yeah, s- really- how you tell yourself stories really, mm-hmm. it makes a difference in how you're able to live your life and thereafter. And so learning how to tell yourself useful stories is incredibly important. Uh, but then also I, I've done a lot of thinking recently also in related to the on- in relation to the online course that I'm teaching. That, it, that I think you'll find fascinating. And that is that I think, so we're, we're all familiar with like this lizard brain, monkey brain versus higher self, sort of like the, yeah. you know, the part of your brain that does the higher thinking and yeah, all the, the moral the, judgments and language and all this. Right? Yeah, the, the whole, the, the book, The Whole Brain Child calls it the upstairs brain and the downstairs brain. And I like that. I go with that. Uh, I love that. Upstairs and downstairs brain. So there are a million metaphors throughout history for this, right? right. Because people right. are always struggling with, there's what I want to want to do. And there's what I actually want to do. And I would like to go work out, but I'm actually going to eat Cheetos, right? So like, that's the, the human struggle of all time is yeah. that there's the like highest moral good that you aspire to and the fact that you're just going to eat snacks while you're at home. And so um, I'm really laughing about this because just yesterday, Sophie, start, Sophie starts saying, why don't we have some Cheetos? And I said, well, we've got some of those Trader Joe's chips in there and they're really healthy and tasty. Yes, but they're not like Cheetos. <laughs> Her downstairs brain wants Cheetos, Alan. You can't. You can't stop people once they want Cheetos. And so that is also a universal human truth is that the part of your brain that's downstairs is also, unfortunately, the part of your brain that controls behavior. And so you end up doing the things that you don't want to do because that's the part of your brain that's that's operating on the level of behavior. And the reason that sales is such an interesting career, right, is because you're learning how to speak to the downstairs part of people's brains using upstairs language. That is like the whole career. And, and, and that's so, the whole, whole, whole thing about successful parenting too, by the way. <laughs> and it's, it's also the moment of self-development that things begin to work, right? When you learn how to speak to your own downstairs brain using upstairs brain language in such a way that you actually start driving behavior, 
then you start seeing your own self-awareness and self-development. Mm, that's grow. interesting. I hadn't thought about that really. It's oh, true. And so I think that's why stories are so powerful is, oh, oh hey, hello. Look, 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 so we had showed up. This, this is nice. Yes. This is my Sophie who's, who's, who's been wanting Cheetos. Hey, Sophie, what's your question? Hey, do you still want Cheetos? Oh, oh, Doritos, excuse me. She wants mm. Doritos, excuse me. Same family of stuff, but Doritos. We've pivoted. we pivoted. Right? <laughs> to another processed snack. No, I have and not asked I want a snack. I have this not asked Bonnie to get Doritos yet, but I, I will. I'll call her. So, listen, I, <laughs> no, as soon as I finish no, no. my conversation with this. Oh, you want macaroni and cheese. Okay. Get get. Oh, and you want me to buy you what for my? Okay, okay. Look, I promise you, I'll do all that. Just give me another, give me another twenty minutes, please. Okay. A hundred hours. <laughs> uh, 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 oh my gosh. Another twenty minutes, please. Twenty right? minutes. Yeah, and, and we'll be good. Okay. Can we do that? Okay. Thank you, baby. Don't worry. Twenty minutes. Okay. Okay. And there's something. Uh, there's something uh, ringing out there. Some alarm ringing. Thing. Can you turn it off, Sylvie? Okay, great. <laughs> wow. Those of you at home missed it, but we talked so much about snacks that I snuck away to get a snack. <laughs> and you're making me jealous. My downstairs brain is saying, Steve, I want those snacks. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I think stories work so well, is they are a way for us to tell our upstairs brain, mm -hmm. this behavior will result in this outcome. And this outcome is something you want. And yeah. so it generates downstairs brain desire like mm -hmm. it, it, a story, good stories that are effective always have this thing in common. They take a like higher level goal mm -hmm. and they, they relate it to a downstairs brain desire. Yeah. If your story sure. does that, people will act on it. It's amazing. It's so cool. So if you take a like higher brain activity, like I want That's a cool. more successful life, I want flourishing and prosperity and I want to go to the gym and you take it and you tell someone some way that they can eat Cheetos and it will result in them being in the gym, all you have to do is tell them that narrative and then suddenly they will connect those two things. That's why we go to work and we have jobs and we like get a paycheck is because we're telling ourselves a story about like, wow. I will be able to provide for myself because of this thing. And that's what stories are useful for. Isn't that so cool? Wow, that's, wow, that's quite a revelation because now I realize how uh, virtually all of um, Aesop's fables mapped into that paradigm. Isn't like, that crazy? It hit like me the, for the first time like two weeks ago. I finally put that framework around it, and I was like, oh, my gosh. Wow. All of my stories are going to work now. That's powerful. That's powerful. Like the um, one of the famous ones from Aesop was the, the, crow, the crow and the fox. And I you know, remember it in generally, but the idea is the, the crow has this, you know, has gotten this cheese, got this cheese, you know, and the fox wants it. And the crow's up in the tree, and the fox can't get up to the crow. Well, anyhow, the, the, the fox convinces the crow that the crow has a beautiful voice, which, of course, the, the crow doesn't. And he's saying, would you, would you please sing for me? And so the, the, the fox is able to flatter the crow to the point that the crow starts singing, of course, drops the cheese out of its beak, and the fox gets it and eats it. So it's like, oh, okay, when this person is flattering me and tell me something i you know uh, uh, whoa beware beware because it's the it's the downstairs brain that's saying oh yeah i i really i'm i'm great i sing beautifully i you know i i want to sing i want to be admired as that's and it's the upstairs brain that, that gets involved there and says oh, beware you know beware <laughs> there's so many different levels of upstairs and downstairs brain interaction going on in that story right now you're yeah. using your higher level complex thinking to do self-protection and self-awareness and to make sure that you will be protected by yeah. looking out for other people trying to manipulate your downstairs brain the downstairs by playing brain. to another one of those desires, which is belonging and acceptance. Exactly. And, uh, and, oh, it's just so cool and, once and you get those tools. And admiration. Mm. And, and hey, yes, baby. Hey, Sophie. I, I, Nina wants Doritos too. Okay, we'll get Doritos. We'll oh, get Doritos for both of them want Doritos, man. They You're out of luck. <laughs> it's over. We're we've getting got, Doritos. We got, we've got two. My, my downstairs brain is outnumbered here. We've got two, <laughs> down, two downstairs brains against one upstairs brain. It's not going to work. <laughs> okay, so. Oh, my gosh. That's so funny. You're not Listen, wrong. You're she, not she, wrong. Comes, she comes along at exactly the right timing to illustrate Just the downstairs brain stuff. Really does. It's great. It's so great. Okay, okay so I've <laughs> Okay. Oh, here. Let's see what we're doing here. Pinky Once promise. Again. Pinky, pinky promise here, Sylvie. Pinky promise. You have to do it or else I get a snack. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh. The oh. stakes are high now. Yeah, they are. They really are. Oh, my gosh. <laughs>
Okay. So with that illustration about downstairs and upstairs brain in real life, in real life. let us move to, okay. So I don't think you do this. A lot of the time you'll put a whole lot of ideas together and it's very intellectual and like fascinating and useful and fun to talk about, but it's not necessarily a story. What I am trying to point out is that one of your talents is putting really complex models together about how the world works. And I think that's why you relate to my, my story about stories and why you're so fascinated by this new model that I just gave you about storytelling is because oh, yeah. you do this intuitively. You build these models all the time that a lot of people, you know, they, they just don't put the effort into like putting models around the world and seeing how they work or testing them and seeing if, and so I seeing you do that all the time totally fascinates me. And one my, I only had one list item for our call. If I would have okay. filled out that Calendly form instead of you, I had one list item and it was, was it? interrupt granularity. Okay. Yeah. And the reason for that is that you mentioned this years ago, five years ago on our calls, and it has been a like running theme through all of our calls. And I really, really heavily considered pushing you to give a, a TED talk on interrupt granularity. And it turned yeah. out you had a much more relatable story that you wanted to tell that I think was beautiful on stage. And so it just wasn't the time for that. But I still wanted to explore that if we got a chance to re- explore that in show form. Interrupt granularity. Do you remember the first moment that that concept occurred to you? Oh, yeah. I was out in California. I was uh, reading The Media Lab by Stuart okay. Grant. Oh, and, no uh, way. I mean, well, it brings uh, us nicely full circle. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that's why I put that on the list. And this kind of links into the talk with your mom about the history of video. Well, before, yeah. we, had, before we had digital video, what most people don't realize is that video was analog. In fact, uh, film, film is still shot in analog, you know, the really high quality 35 millimeter film. And, and that's, mm-hmm. that's analog and not digital. And, you know, uh, digital means I'll be broken down into numbers. Analog means that it's just kind of like a physical thing. So yeah. you know, you know, it, for folks who don't know the difference, I mean, they can look that up. But it, is that, see, we were in a transition period between what we have now, which is what is called, well, then was called multimedia, right? Mm. And Nicholas Negroponte was one of the first people who said, listen, guys, it's all going to be one thing. At some point, everything is coming together. And then fast forward, we got we got Mark Andreessen saying, hey, software is eating the world, like what, four years ago or some software eats the world. And his example is like, you know, used to you would go to Radio Shack and you spend X number of dollars for this one thing and you get this one thing and this other thing and this other thing. And now they're all, they're all on your phone. They're all one thing. Because mm-hmm. it's all digital. And so, but in those days, we had the computers so computers control, could control things. And, but if you wanted to introduce video into your lesson or to your experience, whatever it is, you had to reach out from your digital platform, which is the computer, and bring in some analog video. And so that was a pretty complex process. And video discs had an interrupt granularity of one thirtieth of a second. Okay. okay. And in some cases, one sixtieth of a second because of the nature of the TV at that time. And vi- in you know, right. Uh, so you're talking about the frame rate of the video that's stored on yeah. the disc. Yeah, what the is frame. interrupt granularity for us? If you had to describe or like put a definition together. Uh, well, let me try to tell a story on this. What is okay. interrupt granularity? Okay, and and as it relates to the technology, let's say that I wanted to um, understand something that you said. Uh, a sentence that you said. Well, rewinding, you know, say 15 seconds like we do in our current, you know, digital video, like you've got these yeah. little things that either go back to the whole beginning of the thing or maybe 15 seconds or maybe 10 seconds. That's arbitrary. I created a program. I actually did the programming at the time to in a video disc where you would go back to the beginning of the sentence. It was semantic. It wasn't arbitrary like 10 seconds or 15 seconds, you would say you're listening and you say, wait a minute, I didn't understand that that, that sentence. What do we do as human beings? We say, if I didn't understand you, you if we're friends, I can say, oh, Steve, would you say that again? I just didn't understand. I didn't quite get it. But there wasn't a digital way to do that. And so you built this semantic digital manipulation that understood where the beginning of a sentence was and and went back to it. Was that because video discs were transcribed? It was no, they were not transcribed, and the process was was is it was pre artificial intelligence. I I ha- actually hired my two sons to sit down and do chunking. You come, this comes back to the chunking, is okay. that you you could the the program could talk to the video disc player and say, you know, go back to the beginning of a certain address 
on that video disc. And the address is the finest granularity you could have was every, let's say, 30th of a second. Gotcha. But usually in human, what's interesting is in human co communication, that's usually fine enough to catch the beginning of a chunk and the end of a chunk because chunks in spoken communication are not always sentences. Okay, interesting. You know, sentences are sort of an artifact of writing. Huh. What are right. chunks? Chunks are some pieces of communication that have you know, that that convey you know, a complete piece of meaning from the beginning to the end. Which sometimes takes a couple of sentences, and sometimes only takes an exclamation point. Exactly, exactly. That's wow. it. Given the, it, which is all, it's, it's all context sensitive, right? It's all yeah. sensitive to the context of it, you know what you're saying to whom, with whom, and about what. Okay, so that that so. My, my so this guys. is pretty fascinating. Let me tie a few of these ideas together. So you okay. hired your kids to understand chunking and to help you program this thing to, to yeah. back up to the beginning of a chunk. Yeah, because that involves sitting down at a, at a you know sitting down at a computer keyboard that was connected to a, a, a video disc player, and then you know playing through and listening and cat you know yeah I did say well that's the beginning so you of would just mark each chunk yeah and then yeah. it could skip back to the beginning of that so it was like hand tagging. Where then you could eventually teach an AI how to do it, but you guys didn't have the technology there. Yeah, we didn't that's have technology. That's very interesting. Yeah. Okay. That's so, all so I want to I want to tie all that back into what you were just talking about. So chunks, I think, is really interesting. There's this tool called Notion that is what I'm publishing this whole project on. Yeah, I, don't know I noticed you, that. So you signed yeah. up for the thing, right? So you saw that it's like yeah. a web page, right? Yeah. The fascinating thing about Stuart Brand, Nicholas Negroponte, some of the people at the, the Media Lab, but also at Xerox Park and also early days at Apple, they yeah. all had these concepts that now have formed our entire world. When you open yeah. an app and you interact with a graphical user interface, you are doing the work that they conceived at Xerox Park in the 70s. And yeah. not a lot of people know that like ontological history of like how our world works now. But really, a lot of the day-to-day -day decisions we make about windows and resizing them and colors and buttons and all of this all that, yeah. was an idea in someone's head in California in the 70s. Yeah. And yeah. they realized, oh, computers are being used for like very boring, dumb things like sending oh, yeah. people to the moon <laughs> using a whole bunch of wires that are plugs that no one understands. What yeah. we could do is we could, we could design computers to work like humans work. We could use documents as an analogy and we could build digital versions of those things and then we could yeah. have an interface that looks like a desk. It's like a de top of a desk. We could yeah. call it a desktop. <laughs> And yeah, so like this exactly. blew people's minds. And there's a video online called The Greatest Demo of All Time. If you Google it, I'm sure you've seen it. It's probably this Steve is, Jobs, right? No, it's, it, this was the first demonstration of a graphical user interface oh, ever, wow. period. And this oh. Steve Jobs, I think, may have been in the audience or saw it later, but he eventually oh. toured Xerox Park and it inspired oh, yeah. him to start oh, Next. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But this was the people at Xerox Park demoing their graphical user inter interface for the first time. No one had ever seen a desktop before or a mouse or a button click or any of this, right? Wow. The people at Notion did all, so they're all my age, right? They're all 20 somethings and they weren't there for any of that. But they are one of the few companies I think who've really done their research there. They went and interviewed all these former Apple engineers and people who worked wow. at Xerox Park. Wow. And they sat down and they said, okay, now we have the internet, we have high bandwidth, we have the ability to do graphical user interfaces on every device, including our phones, along with really high speed wireless networking connections and really plenty of memory, plenty of, of really all the resources that the computer like thinkers wanted in those days. Yeah. We, you know, I mean, we ended up with We've like a it. whole decade of Microsoft <laughs> telling us that we would never have enough memory in our computers and things not really working like people imagine. And then people kind of forgot that vision of the future. What I love is that the Notion team went back, they looked at that vision of the future and they were like, oh my gosh, chunks, exactly what you're talking about with language. They, they, they looked at some of the theory from Xerox Park and they said, okay, like there are these like human elements of how we interact with computers. We're going to call those blocks and they belong in documents. And this is how we're going to lay out this software platform. And so now Notion is this very interesting attempt at recreating in modern day what, what Xerox Park and the really the core innovators like Stuart Brand of computing and of all of the modern interfaces we now use what they were trying to do but couldn't yeah it's beautiful it's really really wow. cool and so notion has these little blocks that you can move around that are just like chunks whether it's a sentence or an embedded paragraph or a video or it's any piece of information 
and you can put them anywhere on a page. And then that page is live on the internet immediately, but it's also on the, on the notes document in your phone. And oh, wow. there are databases that are easy to cross connect. And it just is everything that computers should be able to do, but laid out in such a fashion that it makes sense to humans. It doesn't feel like this, like a uh, hard to understand interface that I have to learn how to use. And I have to know about computers. To, it, it just makes sense. Like you start wow. typing, you copy and paste a link, you use computers just like you've been taught to use computers but it just, it functions in such a beautiful way. And so wow. I think there's a lot to be said for that level of synthesis of thinking. And that's some of what I really enjoy about what you do too, is you bring all those ideas together, like interrupt granularity, and you don't just apply them intellectually. So next, I want to hear you talk about interrupt granularity in your everyday life, because this is not just a thing you were thinking about chunking in languages. This is something that you apply to like, while you're raising these girls, how do you apply interrupt granularity in your life? Oh, wow. Okay. I'm going to, oh, I, I just glanced at my watch. My watch is telling me I should stand up. That there's a, that's my watch must be somehow or another synced into what you're saying because my watch is demonstrating what interrupt granularity is. It's built into my it's watch. Hilarious. It's hilarious. Yeah. Based on your heart rate and all that stuff, you've been sitting down for too long and thank goodness for, for my watch, which my younger son gave me. Yeah. You know? So interrupt granularity is like it's physiological for one thing like we, we you know we shouldn't our body doesn't like it and my watch has figured that out when my, i'm sitting down too long right and yeah. if, if, if my body doesn't like it then my, my mind will soon follow and my emotions as well right yeah no one likes doing anything for too long whether it's listening to me talk for more than five minutes or watching <laughs> the hobbit which is just way too long yeah. Whether, whether it's a movie or whatever, right? If you're sitting down for too long, you got to stand up at some point. So you interrupt granularity you is your mental model that you use to interrupt yourself on a regular basis. Oh, yeah. And because it allows me to look at what is going on in my head. And this has become really relevant since I had a fall and hit my head on concrete and had a concussion and, you know, it qualifies mild traumatic brain injury so many people are dealing with one sort of brain injury or mm -hmm. another now we could go into that but the issue is that initially right after that all of a sudden my emotional control was totally disrupted i would fly and so interrupt granularity became like a type of of mindfulness where you could look at right well it it it, it, it I, I redeveloped my ability to reintroduce interrupt granularity because it's it's you know, one of these marvelous sayings from the guy that wrote man's victor frankel man's search for meaning that mm -hmm. between the stimulus and the response is a space and in that space it, yeah it lies our power to choose and in our choice lies our something like our future and our growth but when you break it right down that's where we become us or, or not us. I mean, between a, a stimulus comes along and there is a space. And if we are able to make some sort of upstairs brain decision about what our response is going to be, then we are humans. If we do not, if it's our, if we have so little time or whatever, we we're not able to make a valid choice in that space, which is sometimes milliseconds, right? between the wow. stimulus and the response. And that's why the, the downstairs brain is so great that we have it because sometimes you have to react in less time than you can think. Mm. And that's why it's so great, right? Because if our, if our upstairs brain had to you know, make all those decisions, we'd all be dead, right? Yeah. Literally. Oh, yeah. literally, literally. And uh, so, but in this, you know, Victor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, he said this, I heard it on a Tim Ferriss interview where Tim Ferriss was you know, interviewing Seth Godin. So, uh, it's yeah, all these you know, great thinkers and you know, people there that, that, that exist today were you know, involved in helping me understand this. And I thought, wow. And so related to brain injury, what I realized was that my, I, 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 I rapidly ran out of the energy that the, because the upstairs brain takes a lot more, a lot of energy, consumes a lot of energy. And if so, the one of my therapists told me, and it just blew me away. She said, "You know, this brain injury that you have, she says, it's not physical; it's uh, metabolic." Wow. Okay, you're so close uh, to the camera. This is so funny. Back up oh, a sorry, little bit. Sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, well, I, so, I, I, so yeah. this is your brain injury is metabolic, is what she said to you. Yeah. Some yeah, like I mean, it's an it's a matter of energy. She said it's a matter mm -hmm. of energy, and okay. so. 
you know, the, the, the couple of sentences, like I was like going on on it, but, but through the therapy that I went through, um, you know, awareness and physical therapy and all that sort of stuff that was, that's involved in, you can, you can look it up on, you know, therapy for traumatic brain injury, but I was able to once again, control my emotions hmm. because right after the, right after the fall, right after the concussion, all of a sudden I found myself screaming at the girls when before I wouldn't have, scr- I wouldn't have screamed at them, you know, because they were yeah, fighting. So with suddenly one your one. emotions were out of control and this was a function of you getting tired more quickly than you had before. So yeah. it was, it was like you rebuilt your energy. What did you yeah. do to rebuild your energy? Well, first of all, one of my therapists said, she said, it's okay to be tired. It's okay to be tired. If you're tired, um, cause you, you, when you have an injury like yeah. that, when you have a traumatic brain injury, you, you tired all the time. Yes. You, you, you get fatigued very easily. You, you know, she showed me this. So instead of trying to fight it, you would just go to bed. Yeah. You just want to dry, lie down and go to bed. Okay. You so you're you just napping yeah. more often. Yeah. And um, she, she's, and then that's okay. How, how else do you interrupt yourself on a regular basis that, that helps you rebuild this energy? Well, I think mindfulness and meditation is so important to uh, literally somehow or another physiologically in the brain. If I don't do that in the morning, and you, know, you and I used to do that together when we were. That was so uh, fun. Yeah, when we were roommates we were, temporarily, and we roommates got to for meditate a while. every morning. Over every tea. morning. That was so mm-hmm. wonderful. It was wonderful, and I think for it's for good reason that you know mindfulness and meditation are so important today because I'm finding that if I if I get up before the girls get up. And I have my cup of hot water or my, my, I have a whole routine built around that, that somehow that builds the resiliency into my cognitive, you know, upstairs, downstairs brain thing. I don't know what's really happening. I haven't had a brain scan done on that, but it, you know, I breathe because oxygen is another huge thing. Breathing is that you know the upstairs brain requires a lot of energy, which requires sugar and oxygen. Fundamentally, I'm not I'm not yeah. advocating eating a bunch of sugar, but <laughs> he's, but that's how it works. Exactly. That's how it works. That's how it works. Okay, that's interesting. So so then as we as we sort of draw to the close of this call, tie for me together interrupt granularity and semantic granularity. Okay, interrupt granularity is arbitrary. Somebody lays down a, you know, something on a video disc in, in those days are now in digital so video. Interrupt granularity is like time-based. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I mean, semantic it, it, can, it can be. I mean, the, the, fundamental, the fundamental model for that is, a, you know, interrupt is that how fine, how fine can you interrupt things? And now how fine in terms of time, we could say. Right. Okay. right. Uh, how, okay. how, how, how small a chunk? <laughs> how right. small, what's right. the smallest chunk that you can possibly have? Where is semantic granularity? Well, semantic granularity then takes is built on top of those. That's why you want this, your interrupt granularity as fine as possible because if you can take some of those uh, arbitrary chunks and, and assemble them in such a way that they make sense to a human, then you've yeah. got semantic granularity. That is, if I say, you are great, then you, that's, you get that. That's, that's, that has meaning to you. Or you yeah, are terrible, sure. not to flatter sure. you, whatever, whatever, you know. But right. that, that, if I just say, you, and, and that's the interruption, you don't get it. You don't but, understand. But, oh, yeah, could so be. Unnecessarily a digital. Of, yeah, yeah. So semantic granularity is a way to re-analog digital things. It's a way to, to re-analog? I guess well, that's a nice way of thinking. I'll have to think about that. <laughs> okay. That's what it sounds like to me is that you're, you're taking something that was once real and laden with meaning and has uh-huh. been digitized. Oh, and then you're returning, you're, then you're, you're returning return. it to meaningful. Yes. There you go. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. I love that. That's and fascinating. Then, and then, you know, we're, we're, we're wrapping up here, but I like to think of it in terms of how arbitrary sometimes our, our traditions make us think of time like we, we, we want to chunk time up into years and we celebrate the new year. And often I've thought, what if, we, what if we took that mindset and applied it to every minute or every day? You know, that, hey. Do you, don't you think that would be a little, a little too upstairs brainy? I would think that be too much upstairs brain? It's, it speaks to my downstairs brain, I think. It's like you were talking about the story thing is that um, – mm. I, if, if, if I, for example, if I 
look at, oh, wow, the New Year's is the big thing. And I'm going to do this. I'm going to go to the gym. And I'm going to do this this year and that this year. I'm going to do it every day. I'm going to do it, you know, three times a week or five times a month or whatever I'm going to do. And you set this thing up and all these aspirations. And you're thinking of your life as this coming year. You're going to fail. Okay. And that, I think, is what's so appealing to me about the way you always talk about interrupt granularity, is this challenge you have for yourself to take the things that you would usually only check in on every five years mm -hmm. and instead check in on them every day. Yeah. Okay. I understand well, what you're saying. I think that speaks a lot to how I think of goals and how you think of goals being different. You're thinking of the things that we do on, on New Year's as being like, oh, I want to check in with my core desires and make sure I'm doing those things. And yeah. I think of New Year's as like this very brainy process where I have to plan out <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You do actually. You blow me away on that. It's just <laughs> that's funny, but I—that's why I react so viscerally. But I—I I, I think you're right that maybe it is worthwhile checking in with ourselves every single day. Is this, if this were a new year, is this what I would like to do? Yeah, I think that that where your plan, which is great, I think it's awesome the way that you plan. But then that you allow for your humanity, and you say, okay, this is my overall plan. Sometimes and this is what I'm aspiring to. Yeah. Yeah. But then you. But I you, do try to allow room for failure, design for, for humanity and for resilience yeah. and for the fact that things are never going to go like you plan them to. A but, plan is not for actually doing, it's only for guidance. For, for guidance. But the thing is, you, guidance, that's, that's the word. You have a direction there. And like mm -hmm. Yogi Berra said, um, if you don't know where you're going, you'll end up somewhere else. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And that's great too. And I, I think the to to share a quote as well, since you're so good at that, um, Steve Jobs, who we just spoke about in reference to so many things. Uh, I think the one thing he said that hit me most is that uh, it is something you can do every day. He had incredible interrupt granularity. He would look at himself in the mirror each morning and he'd say, if I were to die today, is today how I actually want to spend my day? Is my plan for today how I would I be okay with spending my day this way if this were my last? That's a really brave thing to ask every morning. And some days there are just things that you don't want to do. But to at least be checking in with yourself on a regular basis so yeah. that you don't get caught in months and months of the answer being, oh, no, I don't want to do what I'm doing today. And every, so morning, important. every morning you're yeah. saying that yourself, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And, 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 and if you never check in, but, but on New Year's, you never know. <laughs> and that's right. This is, this is a line from a, a poem, Benny Hill. Then up spake brave Horatius, the captain of the gate. To all men upon the earth, death cometh soon or late. And what better way to die than facing fearful odds for the ashes of our fathers and the temples of our gods? And oh. I, think, I think that to me, this inspires me because every day. Now, okay, of course, you know, obviously I don't particularly aspire to get to die for the ashes of my fathers. I don't know where they are. <laughs> and I don't think they're particularly important, nor the temples of my gods, because, you know, I, I don't have a bunch of temples of my gods. But I think the idea of what's valuable, obviously, uh, extrapolating from that sit historic situation when these were the, the symbols of the value of the, of the culture, the values of the culture, the values of the civilization. And Horatius and his, you know, it was all about defending Rome and, you know, putting your life on the line to defend your society, your culture, your people, your family. You know, it, you're talking about family. Even when you say father, you know, the ashes of my fathers, you're talking about family. And the symbols of my gods, you're talking about your values, your culture. <laughs> Almost three times. So, yeah, okay. so, every time. Every time, every time, right on cue. I love that the lighting is changing, too. So you look increasingly <laughs> spooky as you talk about this poem. It's great. It's very good. <laughs> okay. So you're right on time, baby. I, 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 but <laughs> well, this was a wonderful conversation. How should we wrap up? We should wrap up. Whoa. How should we wrap up? I don't we know, Steve. say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Sophie's got we'll to let say Sophie goodbye. decide. That's it. That's Sophie's how we'll wrap it. up. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay. laughs> The, the Doritos Goodbye. had it. The Doritos took over. The downstairs brain took over. Thank you, Steve. It's been awesome. Just say goodbye, I guess. <laughs> yeah, just say goodbye. <laughs> it has been awesome. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> Goodbye. Thanks, Steve. Bye-bye. <laughs>